a team of persons associated together in work or activity as a group on one side, such as in football or debate, or a crew or a gang. And think about a crew. What is a crew? A crew is a group of people that go out and do some work, like set up a telephone pole, right? Could be a one. Dig an irrigation ditch. A crew. But it's kind of a wild group that's kind of just going out to do something collectively. A gang, on the other hand, another one, is frequently very highly structured with a leader who's managing the gang, right? But it's kind of unruly, you know, as, as well. But if we think about this a little bit more, but what you've got is people associated together for work or an activity. So it's oriented around work, accomplishing something, okay? Now, what kinds of teams can we think of? Well, we could say a doubles team in tennis, that's a team, tennis team. We could say a cricket team, team that plays cricket. We could say a team that gets the job done, uh, we want to get a job done quickly, so let's split up into teams, right? You divide yourself up into teams. Or you could say we worked as a team to accomplish our business plan. Now, if you look at those, those are very different things. A tennis doubles team has two people, only two. That's enough. They have a team. But they have to work together and be complementary all the time. If I think about the history of the India uh, tennis team in the Olympics, that's not a good example of a team. Why? The people aren't working together. <laughs> They're focused on the wrong issues. They're not working together. Okay. A cricket team. How many members does that have? Cricket. Eleven. No surprise, there's so many pauses in this audience, right? Eleven. Seven to six. Extended team. Okay. 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 okay, very good. Point is, very much more complicated. To go from two people to 11 people is much more complicated. And then if you add six people and a coach, it gets more complicated. But also a team, it has to function uh, together. Similarly, splitting up into teams, that's a different idea. That's the idea that here we are, we're all doing something, and we might have a very large group, and then we divide up into a small group to have to do a specific task. As your companies get bigger, these types of things happen all the time. You have to split up into teams. That has a different kind of a, a meaning. And then the last one is we work as a team to accomplish our business plan. That is about a specific goal. We have a business plan. We have to accomplish it by a date. It's got to get finished. We have a lot of people that have to do different things for that to get done. The financial guy has to present you know, the, the projections. The market guy has to think about you know, what's the market. Now, these may not be different individuals, but it's a coordination to accomplish a very specific type of a task, like finish a business plan. That team, when the business plan is finished, may be gone. You don't need that team anymore. You did that. And people then still have their, uh, their own um, roles to play. So those are all examples of teams. Now when we talk about team building, this is the thing that's the most important. Once you know what the team is, you have to be able to say, how do I build a team that will work, that will function correctly? And this in young companies is very, very, very difficult. Sometimes you don't have enough people, you don't have enough resources, we'll talk about that later. But what team building is about is it's an organizational development technique, in other words, to help build your organization, to improve your performance and attitudes. There's two things. Performance is one thing, getting the job done. Attitudes is a different thing. How do we feel about doing it? What kind of uh, attitudes do we have about our work, about each other, but our values. And the team has to have both a performance orientation as well as an attitude orientation. And we do this by clarifying goals and our expectations about each other. So those are two different things again. You have to think for the team, where are we going? What's our goal? What are our attitudes and what are the activities about the goal? And also about how we interact with each other. Because the team has to be mutually independent, mutually interdependent. Okay? Another definition, this is a different one. It's a philosophy of job design. And this is about how do you create roles and responsibilities within your team, right? In which employees are viewed as members of interdependent teams. So this is now as your organization gets a little bit more complicated. You know, what does a marketing person do? Why is marketing different from sales? What does the chief financial officer do? What do you do when you're the chief technology officer? What does the research you know, department do? So you have interdependent teams becomes the focus instead of individuals. And that distinction is critical to how teams are built. 
And frequently in young organizations, that's the opposite of what they do. What they do is find individuals and they organize around individuals. I'm listening, right? They organize around individuals, but they don't think about how those individuals fit into the larger team. And that's a very significant mistake or limitation. The other part of team building which is important is the ability to identify and motivate your individual employees so the team stays together, works together, and achieves together. In young enterprises, one of the most uh, significant problems or limitations is turnover. People leave. And if the team doesn't stay together, you can't be successful over the long term. You have to learn together, communicate together, work together, and achieve things together. Why? Your business plans, if I look just at the couple that I saw, well, they run up five years. Investors want three or five years of financial projections. They want to know, you know, what's the business going to be like, you know, and how many quarters in the future. And if you don't have a team that stays together, you can't get there. It's easy to create the spreadsheet that shows where you're going to be. It's easy to make all the assumptions. This is what's going to happen. The hard part is having a team that's going to execute that and stays together through the execution of the plan. Now, why do you do team building? Okay? And this is, the reason I'm focused on this is, again, too frequently young enterprises don't do team building. Why don't they do any team building? Too busy. Everybody's running around, you're trying to do 10 jobs you know, at the same time. Say, oh, we don't have time for team building. But if you don't have team building, you don't actually end up with a very good team too frequently. So what is team building about? Why do you do it? First, you get to know each other. Every time you bring in new people, it's important that they get to know each other. Boosting morale and motivation. Again, in young uh, companies, one of the problems is people lose morale if they don't have success, you know, quickly. Team building is about boosting morale and motivation. Why are we doing what we're doing? Improving your communication and relationships. Are we all really operating with the same business plan? Are we all really trying to get to the same objectives? Do we all really have the same values? That type of communication and building relationships with each other is critical because if somebody doesn't share your values, they don't understand how they relate to each other, you're not communicating your mission, the team is not going to work very effectively. You also have to identify and utilize the strengths and weaknesses of the team members. That's very important. Not everybody can do everything. Even in young, in young companies, that's what you think you can do. You don't have people, you give people tasks to do, you think everybody can do everything. Sometimes you, that's the only choice that you have. But usually, once you have a small group, even if it's five people, that's really not the case. People have strengths and weaknesses. Some things they're good at, some things they're not good at. Team building is about utilizing people for the best thing that they're good at, using their strengths, avoiding their weaknesses, and bringing the whole organization up. Next one. Getting everybody onto the same page. This is a critical issue as an organization gets bigger and as you bring in new people. So you have to constantly spend time making sure that everybody's aligned, understands where you're going, that you're all on the same page, and also that you have goals and you're monitoring your project, your process towards goals. And that constantly involves getting everybody onto the same page on a regular, regular basis. And improving productivity and collaboration. What's that about? That's about, we have goals. Are we actually getting to those goals in the best way? Are we collaborating in the best way? Are we being productive in the ways that we need to? And team building exercises are about looking at that question of, are we obtaining our goals on a regular basis? And then the last one is about identifying and developing leadership skills. Because in team building, you get the opportunity to see who can lead and who can't. Not everybody is a leader. Some people who are good leaders can't do other things, but leadership is very important. So team building is about, over a period of time, finding out who the leaders are you know, in your organization and developing their leadership skills. Summary, team building 101, right? Takeaway from this. Team's a group that works towards a common goal. We've got to do that. Team building is the process of enabling the group of people to reach the goal. That's what it's about, reaching goals. That's the main thing. Stages involved are clarifying the goals. What are the goals? Frequently in younger organizations, people say things like, I'm so busy, I don't have time to plan. People tell me that all the time. I am so busy, I have so many things, I don't have time to plan. Anybody who does that, failure. 
Any CEO who tells me that, I know they're going to fail. Why? Not thinking ahead. You're being subject to events. You're reacting, not proactive. Team building and, uh, chief and clarifying team goals is about thinking about things in the future, constantly knowing where the, where the goals are. Next is also important, identifying the issues and obstacles that are barriers that inhibit you from reaching your goals. This is very important as well. I often ask people, what are your main challenges and constraints? Right? What are the things that are, are your problems? Right? What are your main constraints? My least favorite kind of entrepreneur, bar none. I hear it all the time. None. Everything's great. My business is so good. I can do everything. I'm nothing. No constraints for me. Anybody who says that doesn't know what they're talking about. I hear it all the time. All the time. Everything is great. You need to know what are the obstacles. Those are the things to focus on. What are the barriers? Things that make it so you won't succeed. Those are the things to focus on. The good things you've got to know, but it's the barriers and the issue and the challenges that bring you down that make you that make mistakes. Then team building is about addressing those issues together. How are we going to address those? How do we remove the barriers? How do we get our goals achieved? Right? That's what team building is about on the positive side. So in team building 101, if you set yourself in your organization, maybe I'm not doing team building if I wanted to, how would I do it? These are the types of things that you need to focus on. Okay. Next. What are the obstacles? Right? I said team building is about understanding the obstacles. Usually these are what the obstacles are, more or less. Lack of money or funding, you all know that one. Skills, knowledge, and experience, that one you understand you know, as well. You don't have the knowledge that you need to do what needs to be done. You don't have the experience, you're new doing something, you don't know exactly how to do it. Uh, you may not have anybody on your team that knows you know, how to do it. That's a significant obstacle. That's what events like this you know, are for. About gaining the expertise, gaining the knowledge to be able to handle situations like this. Poor communications is also a critical obstacle. We don't really know what we're doing. We're not communicating what we're doing well, right? We're not communicating what we're doing to the right people. So communication is a very significant obstacle. And frequently, the exercise that I saw about making a presentation to an investor is a question about communication. See, so that issue of how do you communicate to an investor is different than how do you communicate to a supplier, which is different than how do you communicate to somebody who's working for you as an employee. And all of those aspects of communication are part of your team building that can be a very significant obstacle to your team if you're not able to do it right. Unwillingness to share knowledge or collaborate. This usually in small teams isn't the, isn't the main issue. You know, but anytime you get more than five people, you know, particularly when you get to 12 people, something like that, then being able to uh, share your knowledge becomes very important. You have to make effort to share knowledge. And when people don't share knowledge, then people start to make mistakes because they don't know what, it, what each other is doing. Okay? Next one is poorly defined or misunderstood roles and responsibilities. Uh, that one is very important because as your teams get bigger, they become more specialized. As they become more specialized, then what has to happen is you have to be sure that everybody knows what everybody else is doing. And writing things down and having good you know, job descriptions is critical. In small organizations, usually you don't have to worry about that too much, but often that becomes a very significant issue because you sometimes have two or three people doing maybe the same thing, and it's not differentiated enough. So you really have to be sure that you differentiate as appropriate, that you have specialization you know, where you need it. As you add more people, every time you add a new person, what is that new person's role and responsibilities? And if you don't do that, what you find frequently is a mismatch. The person that you hired isn't the person you thought you wanted, and it might not be the person you need because you didn't write down the roles and responsibilities for those people. Lack of direction is also critical. Uh, frequently, uh, an obstacle is just people don't have time to communicate, so they don't give each other good direction. You know, where are we going? CEO is too busy and is traveling all around, you know, the country trying to do sales, bring customers in the door, and then the five or six other people that are supposed to be doing something else don't have any direction while the CEO is gone or something. That type of lack of direction creates people being fragmented. Uh, people are off kind of doing their own thing, and the result of that is ineffective teamwork and the organization suffers. Absence of trust is a, another one. 
and that's one that can happen in small or large organizations, but if people don't trust each other in a team, the team doesn't work very well. And I again go back to my tennis example, you know, in uh, you know, the recent things in the Olympics. When people are talking the way that the various people that were talking about how they feel about each other, it's going to be very hard to have a doubles team that's very effective because there's too much other stuff going on when people don't trust each other. Now, what's the framework for teams? What, what do teams need to have to be successful? Because every team needs to have a framework in which it's working. And this type of uh, discussion, these types of points, are critical for you to have your teams work. It doesn't need a lot of time to do things like this, but maybe it needs a one-day offsite. Maybe you need to do that you know, once a quarter, once every half year, depending on your organization. You at least need to do it kind of once a year to say what is the framework within which we're working this year looking forward. First thing is a vision, near and longer term. Where are we going now? Where are we going to go kind of, you know, three months or six months? What's that vision? You have to have that to have the team be effective. Mission it defines what the organization and the team is doing. That's also critical. You have to be able to say, this is who we are, this is where we're going, this is what we're doing. All right? Values. Teams have to understand the values of the company. You know, what kind of people you know, are we? What, what do we hold that's important? Is being green you know, very important to us? Is the wages that we pay the people that work for us you know, very important? Is uh, non-polluting you know, uh, you know, very important? Uh, all the other issues of values that are, are very important. And the reason that values are fundamental is if you don't know what your values are, it becomes hard to make good decisions. Because you don't know really what you stand for. And one of the problems in the modern society is that many organizations don't have any values, or the values they have are not articulated, right? So uh, just making money becomes a value. You know, that's all we want to do is make money. That becomes a value, okay? Next, we have to have a strategy that zeroes in on the key success approaches. In other words, how are we going to accomplish our goals? What's the strategy? That's, again, the type of an issue that people frequently miss because they're too busy. I don't have time to think about strategy. I'm too busy. I don't have time to plan because I'm too busy. I don't have time to have spend focus on teamwork because we have too many things going on. The world looks like that, but what you find is if you make the time to do these things, then you become more efficient, you become more focused on what you're doing, and your teams become more effective. You have a much better chance of accomplishing your results. And last, you have to have goals and action plans that guide daily, weekly, and monthly you know, activities. Uh, again, for small organizations, you may not need daily, uh, but you know, the more uh, specific your goals and your action plans are, and the more time bound, the more successful you know, you're, you're, you're going to be. I once uh, saw a good example of this in which a very, very good CEO said that one of the ways he manages his time is he thinks about all the things that he has to do, he makes a list. Then he says, how many of those are long term? And what are the medium term ones? What are the ones that I have to do you know, tomorrow, right? What are the ones that absolutely have to be done? What are the ones that are um, uh, uh, kind of discretionary? And because he makes all the lists, thinks about everything, and then he throws it all away and only focuses on the top five things. My focus. So many things, you can make great lists, but you really can't do all that stuff. Good to think about it, and you keep coming back to it. But the point is, you can only do so many things at once when you have to have goals and action plans that are measurable. Okay? So what are the 12 C's for team building? These are very good. Okay? You have to have clear expectation of what it is you want to achieve, where you're going. You've got to have context. What is it that we're trying to do that the team is established to do? What are the environments in which the team is working? Commitment. Everybody's got to be committed to the team and believe in it. When some people don't want to play or they're not committed to the team, the team's going to fail if you're not committed to it. Confidence. Everybody has to be able to do their job, right? Otherwise, the team's not going to be effective. Charter. Charter is you need to have um, the mandate for what the team's going to do and what the people within the team are going to do. People have to have the roles and responsibilities and be empowered to do what needs to be done. Control. Control is you have to be able to do the things that need to be done and have the authority to get those things done. You have to be able to control the consequences of what it is that you're, that you're doing. If you can't do that and there's too many external things going on, 
we're going to have a hard time having the team be successful because the team can't control what it's doing. And that frequently is a problem with small companies because there are many externalities that are going on and you don't define the teamwork in such a way that you can control it. If you can't control it, what's being done, your team's going to have barriers. Okay? Collaboration. The team has to be in an environment where it can collaborate. Everybody has to be able to collaborate. The collaboration in doubles tennis is one kind of collaboration. The collaboration in cricket is another kind of collaboration. The collaboration on a business plan is another. And inside your team, however you're organized and whatever you're trying to do, the members have to collaborate. They have to communicate, as we said, and they have to have creative, creative innovation. What is that about? That's about a team is not a bureaucracy. A bureaucracy doesn't usually move very well. And what a team has to be able to do is adapt. It's got to be flexible. It's got to be creative. It's got to be innovative. It sees a problem, it's got to adjust, right? And no matter how big the team is, let's take a team that's designing an airliner inside a company like Boeing. That can be a huge design, you know, manufacturing project. But in the end, that team, with all the different disciplines and everything, has to adapt when something changes in the marketplace or competitively. So creative innovation is something very important to teamwork. Similarly, consequences. What does consequences mean? That means when you set goals and you have action plans, if people don't meet them, there has to be consequences. Right? And that, that's how you get teams to function. Now, it doesn't mean they have to be disciplinary types of consequences or financially punitive types of consequences. But on the other hand, everybody's got to be able to do their job. And if they don't do their job, they have to, there has to be consequences for doing that because that gets people to perform better in the future. So team, teamwork means consequences. Coordination, we talked about. It's got to be communicating and everybody working you know, on the team boundary. And it's also got to have cultural change. What that means is if your culture changes as you get larger, as you bring in more people, as your business plan changes, as the market changes, the culture of the organization frequently needs to change to adapt to the new situation. And the way that your teams work need to change and adapt to your new situation. And this, in a small company, if you've got five people now and you have 10 people next year, that's a huge cultural change. Doesn't sound like much, but it is. If you have 10 people now and you go to 100 people in five years, you have major cultural change. If you're developing a new product and you're in an R&D mode and the R&D mode finishes and the product's developed and now you have to market and sell, that's a cultural change that the organization needs to do and that needs to flow through in the teams. Ten commandments for building high performance teams. Commit to getting the right people on the bus. That's the, the first thing I've talked about. I wasn't going to talk about that too much. But that's important. You've got to have the right people you know, in the company you know, on the bus to be able to have your team work. You've got to have the right people. You've got to get everyone on the same page. Everybody's got to be working together. That's frequently a problem in small companies because people are off doing kind of their own things. You've got to have a learning environment where people learn from the mistakes that they make or from new information that comes in from new colleagues in order for the team to uh, be a high performance team. You've got to share profits and losses. Sometimes people do well, sometimes they don't do well, sometimes the company makes money, sometimes it doesn't. But for a high performance team to work, you've got to have consistency across the good times and the bad times. You've got to be able to share in profits and losses. You've got to commit to turning your own performance. If something doesn't work, the team's got to be prepared to say, we're going to change our strategy, we're going to do something different than we've done before. High performance teams are very good at that. What worked, what didn't work, didn't work, what do we need to do to make it better? Spending time in teams evaluating that is critical to high performance teams. Commit to dancing with those who brought you. That's a very important one. What that means is you, know, you agreed to join a company, you agreed to have you know, colleagues, you have people you're working closely with. If your team is going to be effective and a high performance team, you can't be looking to do something else. Right? You can't be saying, oh, I don't like the people that I'm working with, I wish I had other people. Right? And this is based on the idea of if you go to a dance you know, with somebody, a male or a female, while you're at the dance, you should stay with the person who you went with and don't be looking around for other people. That's a recipe for disaster. Okay? So, dance with those who brought you. Commit to playing to win. Now, this is very important, particularly in the social sector. Even if you're in the social sector, you've still got to play to win. 
Well, what does that mean? That means that accomplishing your objectives and your goals is important. If you don't care, you're not going to do a good job. If you're serving people at the bottom of the pyramid and you don't care, you're not going to do a good job. What that means is you have to define what it is that you want to accomplish and get there. No matter what it takes to get there, that's winning. It doesn't necessarily mean beating other people, right? which is what happens in some, some environments. But what it does mean is you have to take pride in what you're doing, you have to want to accomplish what you're doing, and it has to be really serious to you to get to what you're doing, because that's winning in this kind of a context with the team. If team members don't care, they're not going to be very effective. Okay? You've got to grow through adversity. You've got to commit yourself to do that. All small organizations, all enterprises, have very tough situations. Whether it's Steve Jobs, you know, whether it's uh, you know Mark Zuckerberg, you know now at, at Facebook, all entrepreneurs, all enterprises have adversity, and you've got to commit to going through it. If you just give up when things are tough, you talk to ten venture capitalists and nobody will fund the deal. You say, "Where's number eleven? I'm ready to go." You know, you've got to. Have patience, you've got to work through <laughs> difficult situations. You've also got to have fun. You've got to commit to having fun. If you're not having fun, at the end of the day, you won't last very long. <coughs> that doesn't necessarily mean fun that's frivolous, but you've got to enjoy your work, you've got to enjoy your colleagues, you've got to be committed to what you're doing. If you don't have fun, your team won't last very long. Right? It's got to be enjoyable that's in, in some ways. And then you've got to commit to playing large. That's very important. What does that mean? That means you have to have a big vision of where you want to go. <laughs> Right? If you're just kind of muddling along and doing the same thing at the same level year after year, it's hard to build good, solid teams around that. It can be done. But if you have a larger vision of where it is that you want to go and you're committed to getting there, that makes the team better because you're striving. You know, you're aspiring. You have goals that you want to you know, accomplish, and that's significant. Covered all these points, just a, a little summary, but I'm not going to go through it again. But I am going to just say a couple things down here. Okay? Effective team building is among the most important challenges for any business or organization. And it's something that isn't obvious necessarily. Why? Because as I've said numerous times, people are too busy. They don't see team building as an activity. But that's why I wanted to focus on it today. Because it really is perhaps the most important thing you can do. Because if you've got a good team and you've got a good plan, you've got goals, you know where you're going, you've got everybody collaborating, you're likely to be successful. Whereas if you don't function on this, I like this, you're not likely to be able to scale very, very much. And I'm going to say that this time here. Without effective teams and teamwork, businesses and organizations cannot grow to scale. Impossible. Cannot be done. You have to be able to have teams. It can be different kinds of teams. You can have a marketing team, you can have a corporate team, you know, you can have the R&D team, but all in all, organizations have to have teams if they're going to get to be large. You know, and large doesn't necessarily mean you know huge, but just even to get to 100 people, you know, you have to have teamwork to do it. 20 people, you've got to have teams and a couple. Okay. Now, last subject I was asked to talk about was leadership. Who is a leader? And I thought I would just do this one relatively quickly, but it's very important, particularly in small companies, because frequently in small companies, the company is built around an idea or something that they want to do. Okay. And somebody has the idea, they own the idea, and they say, you know, gee, I want to do this, this is a good idea. That doesn't necessarily make the person a leader. It means they have the idea, they could be the entrepreneur, but they could not have good leadership skills. Okay? The organization might not have any leader. Sometimes young organizations are very flat, and everybody participates in all decisions. I think I know some organizations that were like that. And the result of that can be when there's no leader, Right? is that everything can be fragmented, one thing. Another thing that can happen is any one person can stop everything because one person can have a very strong emotional view and then the other people don't feel comfortable doing anything, so you kind of get stuck. You can go to the lowest common denominator, only things that everybody can agree on, which may not be good you know, uh, decisions. So having a leader in an organization like a, uh, an enterprise can be very, very important. Very few organizations can be very successful without a leader of some sort. So who is a leader? Someone who has to inspire confidence and trust of others. Everybody's got to be confident in the leader and trust them. The leader has to have a vision or a plan to, and a plan to achieve it, both. The vision, where are we going, and a plan. Usually if the leader just has a vision but doesn't have a plan, they won't get very far. 
Somebody's got a great plan, but the vision isn't very good, and that's also not, not good balance. Then they also have to be able to lead the way, okay? Show you how we're gonna get from one place you know, to, to another. Very important, leading the way. And then they have to persist until the vision is achieved. If they aren't strong and aren't persistent, they're not gonna be able to lead very long. So a leader has to have all of those um, characteristics. But what are the, the real qualities of the leader, the personal qualities? The vision is probably the most important. They've got to have a very strong vision that others believe in. A lot of people don't have vision. You know, they like to work, there are good employees, all of that is good. But the leader has to have a vision because they've got to be able to show you where it is that you're going. They have to be dedicated. You have to believe that the leader is going to be there even if things you know, go bad. Even if uh, obstacles come up, the leader has to be dedicated. The leader has to be self-motivated. In other words, they're coming from their own internal sense you know, of leadership, but they also have to be able to motivate others. And if a leader can't motivate others, they won't be very effective as, as, as a leader. They also have to be responsible for their own activities. Again, just be giving everything to everybody else. And they have to be responsible for others. Now, this characteristic of being responsible for others is something most people don't like to do at all. And that's a distinguishing thing about leaders. They'll take on the responsibilities of others. They will you know, support others. They'll, they'll, they will assume the sufferings you know, of, of others. They will assume the workloads of others you know, when they have to. You know, they'll jump in. But they feel responsible for others. They will be persistent. A good leader doesn't give up. You know, they're persistent. They will be committed you know, to the organization and they will communicate the message. Almost all good leaders are able to communicate the message, but they may have different communication styles. Now, I want to give an example of this from, from the Gandhi uh, birthday. I'm sure all of you have seen the Gandhi film about Gandhi's life. Everybody's seen that film and knows that. I'd like to give a, just an example from that film. I just saw this, uh, you know, I guess it was the day before yesterday. Uh, but, and I'd seen it several times, but it really uh, affected me this time, and particularly in this context. This is the scene uh, toward the end of the movie when Calcutta is up in flames and Gandhi decides he's going to go on the fast. Okay? And he goes and he's, he's lying there and the Muslims and the Hindus in this terrible situation. And then all of a sudden, everybody realizes what's happening and they start focusing on Gandhi. And then what happens is you suddenly see Calcutta goes quiet. Remember that scene? Beautiful scenes in Calcutta. And it's early in the morning, I think, and nobody's on the street. It's very, very, very quiet. And then what happens is a group of Hindus comes to Gandhi and he's lying there, you know, in the fast near death. And there's a Muslim gentleman kind of standing off to the side. And the Muslim leaders come, I mean, the, the uh, Hindu leaders come and say, time for you to stop, Babu. You've got to stop this fast. I'm paraphrasing, of course. So you've got to stop this fast. We've told everybody, no more fighting. You've got what you want. Now eat. We're going to go home. It's over. Okay? And Gandhi's very weak and he kind of looks at them, you know, and he's, he's near death. And uh, he doesn't kind of say anything at that point. And the Hindu leaders are very agitated, right? And then they turn and they say, please, this is enough. And they turn to walk away. Mm -hmm. And after they walk away, one of them turns back to Gandhi. And he takes out a chapati and he puts it on Gandhi's lap and he says, eat. Right? And then he says, I'm going to help. This is the reason I'm going to hell is because I killed a child. I smashed his head on the wall. And the reason I did that was my boy, because it was this pig, was killed by Muslims. And he said, I was so angry that I killed this child. He said, because of that, I'm going to go to hell, and now you've got what you want. It's kind of what he says. So we're going to stop all, all of this, and now it's time for you to eat. And Gandhi looks at him, and this was my issue on leadership. He's not leading anybody. He's not, you know, like a general, you know, with a big crowd around. But what he says to the gentleman is, I know a way out of hell. Now that statement was leadership. Why? Yeah. Serious vision. All of a sudden when he says that, somebody says, whoa, what is he thinking? Right? Serious dedication. Right? Here he is on his deathbed, or, you know, pretty close. And then he says to the, to the gentleman, he says, um, the gentleman says, you know, what, what is the, the way out of hell? And he says, what you should do is go and find a young boy, about this big, 
whose mother and father were killed in, the, in these riots. Find a Muslim boy, and you raise him yourself, and you raise him as a Muslim. And he stops. That's all. Well, why is that leadership? That is leadership. He's showing you a vision of the future that's way outside of where people were, what they were thinking. He's showing you dedication from what he had already done with his own you know, body and everything in the circumstance that calls everybody's attention to what he's doing. He's showing his own self-motivation and where he was himself in this environment, but also his ability to motivate others. That simple concept right, was a motivation to everybody that was there, both uh, Hindus and Muslims. Uh, that were there. And he's showing responsibility for not only his own activities, but he's taking on the responsibility for the other people as well by showing them the way. He's showing incredible persistence in that situation and commitment to his overall vision of what all of the independence of India was about and what he stood for. So even though he wasn't out on you know the battlefield, you know, with an army behind him, is what you think about, you know, as a leader, or he wasn't acting like a CEO, the leadership in that type of situation was a very good you know, example of what real leadership is about. And he had more impact by doing that than by coming up with a five-year plan you know, for, for the government. Okay. Leaders frequently face challenges, rejection, criticism, pressure, and perplexity. We just talked about you know, some of those in the Gandhi situation. That's all leaders have this situation where everything's easy, no challenges, no problem. You don't really see usually great leadership. Leadership comes from difficulty. That's what, where our leadership is usually proven. And a successful leader usually overcomes the challenges by staying focused on the vision and the mission. The Gandhi example is a very good one. By using their initiative, their ways changing things, moving things around, by being resourceful, coming up with new uh, solutions you know, to problems, by empowering other people, critical on their challenges and diversity. Usually what leaders do is they empower others and they help others to come up with uh, solutions. They use teamwork. Leaders always have teams of people around who are doing different types of things. And they take charge when it's needed. Not when it's not needed, but when it's needed. The leader will step in, make the hard call. They're not always right, but that isn't what leadership's about. It's not about being right, it's about being a leader. Okay? And they take charge when, when needed, and they often use common sense and judgment. And one of my favorite statistics is about CEOs of large corporations. And they've done many, 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 many studies of CEOs of large corporations, and they ask, what is their educational background? How intelligent are they? Right? And they want to know, don't great leaders come from getting an A of the highest, you know, topper at the Rome Institute of Management and Technology? Isn't that where the great leaders come from? Isn't that they graduated from the Harvard Business School and they were number one in their class? That's where the great leaders and CEOs come from. The answer is no. That is not where they come from. They're usually C plus students. Average. Very average. Why? Because they focus on other things. It's not just their intelligence that's the issue. They're focused on being effective. They're focusing on getting things done. They're focusing on simplicity. They have common sense and good and good judgment. But there's something about their personality that makes it so that they're leaders and become CEOs, not just their intellect along. That's very important. And also on an IQ level, they're also not the highest IQs. For sure, they're also quite, quite average. So those are the traits of a successful leader. This is a nice quote from a uh, former president of the United States. This is a nice quote. But the best leader is one who has sense enough to pick good people to do what he or she wants done, and self-restraint to keep from meddling with them while they do it. That's about team building. Teams and team building. Good leaders have good teams, and they're smart enough to let the teams do the work. Okay. Any questions? Sure. Questions, comments? I guess you have left that you don't so mesmerize. No. <laughs> this is a very tough thing with, with companies, but it's absolutely critical. There's a lovely acronym for team which I could share with you. Sure. It's P E A M. Together, everyone achieves more. That's what it is. Ah, very good. Very nice.
Masih ada. Oke, gitu tuh. Uh, I would also say if anyone wants a copy of this, uh, you know, uh, Proverbs 17, it's freely available for anyone who would like to copy. I think we're just a few, but let's present this all together, right? Yeah. So, uh, thank you for my day. Thank you for coming to the talk. Yeah, I need a broad base. Yeah, sure. Okay.